Okay, hello. Uh, today is uh, January 10th, and we'll talk about, um, first we'll talk about uh, pixelated architecture, a subject that uh, was brought to my attention by an article on the Zine um, design or magazine, or I don't know how to call it, and it's truly a, a vast, uh, a vast subject. And, uh, you know, I continuously discover new works that belong to what is called pixelated architecture. And of course, the pixels are part of our culture, of our visual culture, of our, uh, you know, uh, modus vivendi almost. So how would a pixelated architecture be? This would be, you know, the question I ask in this presentation. Now, I start with this work, of course, big could not be uh, absent because actually Bjarke Ingels is the pixel man par excellence almost. I mean, he laughed, as you know, as a child, he loved to play with Lego and, um, you know, um, those kind of manipulations uh, with, um, with the Lego pieces are very close to what we might call pix pixelated architecture. Uh, so B completes Quito's tallest building with pixelated facade. A facade of cascading balconies defines the residential icon, icon skyscraper near La Carolina Park in Quito, in, uh, in uh, Ecuador, which is Danish, which is Danish architects to a big, big's first completed project in South America. And this is the building. And uh, we see, we see the pixelation. Uh, and do you wonder why did he make it in this way? And I think it's a it's a quality that Bjarke Ingels has that he uh, he has a system, but it is a system which does not reject the spiral, and thus a dynamic quality derives from the spiralic movement. Like here, that what we see in the foreground is just a part of the building, but this part of the building creates that uh, turmoil part, so to speak, and 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 the effect is, uh, you know, uh, enticing in a way. If you compare the building by B with the building next door, the one on the right, we see a change in attitude. It seems we are not happy any longer with an architecture that is um, quietly rectangular, although, although it has to be said, there was often a, a very important architecture built in this way. We cannot dismiss you know, the right angle. It exists and it has nobility and some great buildings were built in that way. But today in the vortex of the, of the uh, you know, the, the, maybe the, the, the digital realities of our time, the virtual world, um, you know, uh, parametry, uh, scripting and programming, uh, the avalanche of news and news and news, then the connection simultaneous with everybody in the world creates some kind of a you know, all this networking, this uh, maddening networking, after all, creates maybe a need for a, an architecture that is, that is less static, less placid, uh, and, uh, and more dynamic and more like a vortex, and like, a, um, you know, a, a torrent, um, you know, a, 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 an architecture that is uh, uh, turbulent, because we are talking about turbulence. And it's not an accident that Mark Wigley, when he was dean at Columbia University in New York, uh, he was so for about 15 years. At one point, he published, uh, you know, manifesto, a turbulence manifesto, where he invited students in architecture and architects to think and and act and project a project now work in, in, in turbulent ways. Now, why would the dean of a very important architecture school promote turbulence? Even uh, an architecture apparently, um, you know, uh, uh, moved by a, by, by a tornado. I'm not really saying because in the system that Bjarke Ingels uses, 
there is uh, there is movement there is a twisting but it's not really a, you know a, a tornado but the desire to 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 problematize the the placidity of the geometry on the the, the building on the right has exists and it's obvious so of course the architect goes through some troubles to 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 create these changes these dynamic changes in the physiognomy of the building but with the technology that we have i guess if, if you have uh, you know uh, people in the office who are very fluent with the with the latest technologies they can do this very easily i imagine i cannot do it i mean i, I can have the vision but from the vision to make a feasible uh, work like this it's a distance you need to have the machine that calculates properly uh, everything that is to be calculated. I mean, look even inside, you know, in concrete to have that piece done properly. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a work that uh, requires knowledge and the right machines, the right software and so on. Now, who lives in such a building? Not the proletarians. I mean, this is South America, it is, uh, but even if it was Europe or the United States or uh, uh, Japan, this is a building for those well to do. An apartment in this building probably cost millions, you know, with a swimming pool uh, on the terrace of the building at the, you know, at, 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 at that height, you know, all that water that is brought from, of course, from the, the level of the earth up there, all these costs. It's, it's an expensive uh, pleasure, but some people can afford it. And for them, big builds in a big way. Now we go to another project. UN Studio creates pixelated facade for Louis Vuitton store from glass and steel bricks. UN Studio, an excellent uh, architecture office in, in, in the Netherlands. And uh, it's a good building. And it's a building that surprises one because it is, uh, it's not ostentatious. It's not modern in the sense that, for example, uh, big works are. It's although UN Studio can do works even more, uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously modern, but this one is trying to almost mimic the, the facade of the building next on the left side and on the right side, particularly on the right side. And I think they do a brilliant job, you know, with uh, <clears throat> this pixelation that is, uh, shows, uh, you know, great rigor. And uh, I'm sure again that they use, uh, you know, some some fine technology to make this, you know, properly. Um, so it is a work that is uh, that has a certain uh, sympathy for the past, not to call it passeist, but employs the technology of the present in order to assume the historicism of the past in a creative way. And I think in this sense, they do something valid. It depends. Is it nostalgia here? Maybe to an extent, but again, UN Studio is not a nostalgic office. It's just that in this particular work, they are. And it shows a great um, availability to, to various approaches to, to architecture. The execution is almost unbearably perfect. I mean, if I contemplate this facade with, uh, let's say, a church built by Sigurd Leverenz in Sweden, where you can see the imperfections of the human touch and so on, here we have none of that. There is no, you know, earthy imperfection. Everything is perfect. This could be a little bit troubling, I guess, for those who want, uh, you know, who want what we can see here on the on the pavement of the of the sidewalk or even the street. But it's still, a, you know, an interesting work, and uh, it shows it shows uh, you know the, the 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 contribution that softwares and and, and machineries in architecture uh, can uh, can make, even even at the level of 
you know, uh, an architecture which at the first sight, maybe superficially speaking, uh, is uh, not very distinct from a traditional, so to speak, building. But what we look at here is actually subtle, very subtle, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a fine mechanism, this facade. And, uh, you know, the pixelation itself, I think, is interesting because it, 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 sub, it, it subverts, it, it, it erodes the, 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 the arrogance of the monolith. So you, you have maybe a big building, not in this case in particular, but you fragment it. And the question is, why do you fragment it? Because I think uh, there is a, a need for multiplicity. There is a need for uh, this fragmentation because otherwise, the, especially the mega buildings become oppressive. But even smaller buildings, if they don't have this, uh, at least to give us the illusion that it was made, the building, placing a brick above another brick, like maybe this would give us this illusion, but it might be just an illusion because it's very possible these were actually manufactured in a factory and not on site because you see the execution is uh, again unbearably perfect now mvrdv of course they couldn't uh, miss the boat designs albania's tallest building with pixelated facade uh, and uh, again we could ask why the need for this pixelation because you see uh, the buildings around this tower, they didn't have the, this need. Well, I think it's, it's not maybe very complicated, the answer. We have the prism, no, the tall prism that MVRDV imagined. And then we have the need to kind of break it, to explode it, to implode it, to distort it. It's a need for change. It's a need for the accident because we are tired or, or we think we are tired of uh, too much regular, uh, regularity or uniformity. So, uh, but there is something else. There is also a need for um, uh, spontaneity, I think, and for uh, uh, the refreshing power of uh, aleatory um, um, you know, configurations. And what we see here is exactly this, the regularity of, of reason, the regularity of uh, cerebrality is um, uh, challenged by this uh, the play, play capricious as it is with these uh, parts that sabotage the, you know, the, 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 the pristine uh, box. And this is very common in these days. And I think this shows a, a deeply city desire for difference, for change, for, uh, you know, things that they need to escape the, uh, 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 the, 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 the oppressiveness of a, of, a, of a system where the individual disappears. So this is a, an effort towards individuation. You try to individu individuate at least some apartments here. You know, you, you don't do it with all of them. These still remain uh, undifferentiated, but, but uh, as opposed to the building on the right where they're all one, here at least we have some people who want to, want to take off, so to speak, from the prism. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a generalized process uh, now it, it, because of also the technologies that we have, we can uh, manipulate uh, uh, building uh, in, in various ways. And uh, we, 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 we strive to arrive at some variety. We need variations, we need variety, we need accidents, we need uh, differences, we need individuation. Now, big pix pixelated complex, Peaks and valleys for Toronto gains approval. I mean, is there any project by big that doesn't get approvals? It's incredible. Now here we see something else. Besides pixelation and besides individuation, well, on one hand, we see unity. Yes, the, the, the parts are together, but in a mountainous configuration 
or mountain-like or hill-like, as opposed to the buildings in the front, the older buildings, the buildings proposed by big are, are uh, well, they are big themselves, but they are, they are, they are tempted to, to uh, evoke some kind of, uh, you know, natural landscape, although it's made through architectural means, you know, hill-like or mountain-like, <clears throat> mountainous-like, but it's still that through an agglomeration or a conglomeration of parts, of small parts that come together. And uh, again, this is, uh, Big is not the only one that works in this way. There are other people and we are, we are going to see other examples. Again, this can be done because we have the technology to, to, to refine such a project and to make it rigorous and feasible. And, uh, you know, it was already done in Montreal in 1968. Uh, you know, Moshe Safdi, when he built Habitat, or 1967, and it was done without the help of the technology we have. Now it is even easier even if the vision maybe is not as powerful as the one had by Moshe Sabdi. And yes, we know this, we climb with the green on the facade of our uh, pixelated buildings because we need desperately um, ozone or oxygen. But I wonder if this is not at least to an extent a perversion, you know? I mean, are we asking this vegetation what it feels? to climb on the concrete of our buildings? Not, no, we don't, because we don't believe you can talk with plants. But uh, who knows? Maybe the plants are not so lacking in, in the respect of, uh, you know, having sensitivity. After all, as you know, it is said that if you sing to a flower and if you place the flower properly at the window and towards sunlight, towards light, the flower um, uh, begins to smile, so to speak. So maybe it's not so stupid, the plant, as we think it is. As for the little insect, <laughs> which I see right now on the floor of my room, a little black dot that moves. And if I approach my, uh, the sole of my shoe, uh, uh, runs immediately, even without looking backwards, because it moves in the opposite direction. Why does it run? Because it feels, because it knows. So it's not stupid. That little black dot is not stupid. It has its own intelligence. It knows when the soul of the aggressive, uh, uh, you know, um, master, if I am to call, uh, you know, uh, myself in this ridiculous way, uh, it comes uh, dangerously close. Anyway, back to big. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I almost feel the need uh, for an office today in the world that is called small, not big. This, this belief in bigness is, is what brought us to the climate change and to the sustainability problems and so on. This obsession with bigness. Big and big and big, big supermarket, big uh, housing complex, big everything, everything big, even the architecture office. Of course, uh, it happens that his name is Bjarke Ingels, and he just added the uh, group. He could have added uh, O, no, B I O, like Bjarke Ingels office. No, he chose G because together the three initials mean indeed bigness. And big capitalism needs bigness. And, uh, you know, he does have a big success. If by success we mean ruining even further the earth with uh, countless buildings, some not bad, some approximately okay, but, but many, one after the other, one after the other. And uh, here is just another example. It's still its majesty, the human being that runs the show. Look here what's going on in Toronto. Building near building near building near building. And this is just a fragment of a city in Canada. And Canada is not even so excessive. There are other parts of the world, as you know, much more excessive than, than Canada. And still, still, what do we see here? We see some uh, 
some green plants, you know, desperately climbing on the building. But do you see any plants? Well, we see a few trees here, but I think they are part of the project by the Archangels. Maybe otherwise, you, you couldn't see trees. Well, there are a few here. Uh, all in all, it's a gray picture, is it? Not, not great, gray, G-R-A-Y, it's gray. It's gray and metallic, very metallic. Anyway, maybe, I'm a, not maybe, I'm sure the apartments would be very comfortable, air conditioned. Do you see any open window? Because I don't see. They're all encapsulated, right? So, you know, I wonder, isn't, isn't the glass actually highly demagogical because it gives you the illusion of being connecting connected with an outside, <clears throat> but you actually connect it only through the eye. No window is open. And I don't think they can be open as far as I see. Well, then you need air conditioning. And you know, air conditioning <clears throat> pollutes, not to speak about the fact that it's very, very expensive. But the people who can buy an apartment in a building designed by big <clears throat> are big people themselves big salaries, big income, you know, most of them probably work, uh, you know, in financial speculations or uh, IT or AI or whatever. They make plenty of money, so they don't care if the, if the electrical bill is huge. Uh, I mean, look at this tree here. Now, I don't know. I mean, am I too naive to, to imagine that I have a dialogue with this poor tree that, that grows here from a concrete slab? I actually pity these this, this, this little trees suspended at these heights far away from the earth. But is the human being thinking about this? And a French architect told me, it is scientifically proven that the, the trees are just fine, you know, growing for, from a concrete slab. But I don't know. I don't know. If God wanted them to grow from a concrete slab, he could have done so, no? In his omnipotence, but he didn't. Anyway, now we come with uh, these trees here. and They look uh, rather exhausted, if you ask me you know, uh, between these two, uh, you know, uh, rather harsh, uh, you know, uh, rows of buildings. I, to me, it is obvious that the human being can continues the assault on nature and uh, despite the big problems that we have. Otherwise, there is happiness, of course, the dog is happy, the child is happy, the parents are happy, they are young and beautiful and well-dressed, and no one works. They just shop, they move around, you know, in jeans and t-shirts, and everything is beautiful, because this is what these renderings uh, uh, try to convey to us. And here, you know, under the trees, beautiful beautiful children, you know, playing like in a beautiful impressionistic, um, um, you know, painting. And it's just a picture of, uh, of, uh, of uh, great, uh, great accomplishment and great uh, harmony and balance. And it tells us nothing about the countless psychotherapy centers that exist, I'm sure, in Toronto as they exist in New York City. I had seen once a map with psychotherapy centers in, in Manhattan, in New York. And I can tell you, they were like mushrooms after the rain. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. And I ask myself, why? If the happiness is so affordable as this rendering by Big seems to say. You know, why would one need a psychotherapist if one has these living rooms? You tell me. I mean, you know, really, why would, it, why would we be anxious when we have such a, such a room? You know, large, of course. 
where even the dog is happy, you know, and doesn't bark, and then uh, grass grows from the slab in the balcony, which is wide enough to throw a party with 50 people, if not more. And then here we have a uh, probably a copy of a Mark Rothko painting. And here, you know, uh, some kind of a mobile sculpture by uh, um, a famous, uh, famous sculptor uh, and uh, American himself. And everything uh, I'm talking about Calder, uh, I don't know. I, I have a feeling we are, we are deluding ourselves. We are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are not telling the truth to ourselves. ourselves. And we see snow. Yes, probably in Toronto it snows, but in Bucharest, this is the third year without snow until now. And it's already almost mid January. And we had a few days ago, 15 degrees Celsius. <laughs> you know, you could have went outside in shorts and with a t-shirt almost. But here, although it is snow, it is sunny. And again, no window opens, but who needs open windows, right? 10 pixelated and Jenga style buildings that tick all the boxes. The number of architecture projects comprising series of cubes or cuboids to look like digital pixels or half finished games of Jenga is stacking up fast. Here are 10 examples from studios, including Herzog and De Moron, OMA and NVRDV. So, two of them from uh, the Netherlands and one from Switzerland. Now, this building in Bangkok by uh, Ole Sharon, uh, I'm not sure I pronounce well his name, this 77-story skyscraper is Thailand's tallest tower and features modular cute, cute or cutaways, cutaways, but it's in, no, it's not cute, it's cutaways spiraling around its facades. It was designed by uh, Ole Sharon, uh, nicknamed the Prince of Pixels. So let's read this again, because this is important. Who is the Prince of Pixels? Ole Sharen, O-L-E-S-C-H-E-E-R-E-N. Uh, Aaron Betsky called him the Prince of Pixels. Aaron Betsky, uh, uh, you know, uh, an important uh, critic and theoretician and architect. He ran the, the Venice Biennial, I think, in 2008. Uh, and he was the director of the Frank Lloyd Wright School, uh, Ateliers and West, and so on. Anyway, so Aaron Betsky called him the Prince of Pixels in a recent opinion column while still working at Rem Kolha's firm OMA. So Ole worked at OMA and completed by his own studio bureau uh, following his departure in 2010. And this is the, this is the building. Uh, again, what do we see here? We see the prism, regular and all, and then eroded uh, rather disturbingly in some parts. Why is this erosion uh, present and why was it needed? Because as I said, uh, there is a need, maybe, uh, maybe it's a sign of pessimism. You know, we are tired of, uh, the optimism of the regular prism, and we begin to, to subtract from it and, and problematize it sometimes with the great effort, structural and financial and so on, because, because the, the pure prism doesn't express us any longer. So this erosion to me could be interpreted that it is in Bangkok or in some other place could be interpreted as a sign of uh, uh, degrowth in a way. Yes, degrowth. When high capitalism is obsessed by growth and growth and growth and production and production and production and consume and consume and consume, then we have architects who uh, feel a need to, to rebalance the situation and to show the other side of the story. And these erosions maybe do just this. Uh, it's very interesting to compare this tower designed by Ole, if we can call him on his first name, and this tower, who I don't know who designed it. This one doesn't have any, any you know, disturbing thoughts. He believes in its uh, 
continuous regular growth towards the sky but this one by Ole is uh, you know a little bit questioning you know uh, and it, it looks a little bit disturbing this questioning it does but just like in the case um, you know of, 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 of a previous building that I showed uh, it's this tension between a gesture of um, negativity in a way of denial uh, superimposed on the typical prism typical you know geometrically said self-satisfied box that it is very tall or very wide or is still a box essentially and again and again no window opens what does this mean an immense effort technological to pump air into the building because otherwise in the summer you would melt down and in the winter you'll freeze now you tell me is this sustainability no it's not not at all but we keep building like this and we still think that like today i read actually that a new glass was invented with water inside like two panels of um, paints of two panels of glass and in between them a thin layer of water and apparently um, the the electrical bill is reduced by 25 percent that it's something magical happens because of that water in between the two pieces of glass you know it's we we, we we continue to think that it, uh, it is only through technology that we can solve the problems we have. It is true that through technology, we created many of the problems we have, but I don't think we can solve the problems only through technology. I think we need a change in consciousness. We need to be a little more modest. We need to, it's true that there is a huge population on the earth. That is true also, but but maybe some change in consciousness is needed more than in the kind of glass we use or maybe both but we still believe a lot in technology we think technology will save us but then then we do have the technology uh, plenty of it and quite powerful but then why the myriad of uh, centers of psychotherapy centers in manhattan why the need for them if everything is so perfect now a building by Herzog and de Moron in Manhattan, 56 Leonard Street, perhaps the most recognizable Jenga Tower, 56 Leonardo Street rises 60 stories over the comparatively low rise Tribeca neighborhood in Lower Manhattan, so New York City. The building comprises a series of cuboid volumes that become increasingly offset from one another towards the top, drawing comparisons with a wooden block gate. And here is the building. It is, we can say, pixelated as opposed to the buildings uh, at the bottom. And it is an expensive building and it is uh, designed by Herzog and de Moreau and the prices you can imagine are accordingly made. I mean, the interior could, could be misleading. That is austere, uh, even severe, you know, it, it's nothing romantic really. It's just, it's just uh, you know, it, it's the perversion of aesthetics that we give the illusion that here is almost a place for proletarians. What proletarians who, who don't need finishes because they don't have money for finishes. That's why I use the word perversion. This is an immensely expensive building I'm absolutely sure no apartment costs less than several millions. And uh, the people who live here flirt with the idea that, uh, you know, a certain brutalist part can, uh, uh, you know, uh, engage them on, on the road of, uh, you know, uh, raw romanticism. But that is not at all the case. The building is so, it's okay. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's you know, uh, uh catching the eye so to speak but it's still an elitist building uh, designed by elitist architects and 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 again no window opens plenty of windows but none opens <laughs> why because they can because there is the 
diabolical machine which pumps air up into the building and then comes uh, con edison with the uh, with the bills the electrical bills but no problem someone who can buy an apartment here can certainly pay for that electrical bill who cares that uh, you know uh, air conditioning pollutes when you see so much sky above above you or uh, the level of your eye you don't care about really climate change and pollution so who cares if the seas are growing in height who who cares if you live in this building and you know the level of the seas is going up they cannot reach you can they i mean you live in this town maybe at the top who cares about what's happening at the bottom mvrdv reveals renderings of mirrored clear crystal rock office block in germany interesting no interesting because again is mvrdv they are sabotaging the you know the predictability of the of the uh, you know rationalistic box they break it too we see here clearly and we are going to see another even more alarmingly uh, so called um, you know ingenious building by them uh, why the need to wound the building because yes the building is wounded no it's really wounded it shot through it shot through and 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 why is the same gesture of, of showing in a way a uh, uh, disbelief in our own times now of course in this rendering the little boy looks astonished you know totally seduced and from this very moment that child is destined by god and by his mother and by everything and everybody including mvrdv to become an architect this seems to be the message the child looks astonished at the latest creation of mvrdv and the future is already uh traced <clears throat> i will be an architect mvrdv designs cons constructivist inspired tower block for moscow <clears throat> and um, this was proposed before uh, moscow decided that its land already the largest in the world is not large enough so it needs to capture more land from ukraine <laughs> you know it's hard to believe but that's how it is you know you have the largest country in the world at your disposal with the biggest land and you want more this shows clearly that bigness is not sufficient anyway pixelated as it is uh, sorry that that picture we are going to arrive at it later now fujimoto in paris uh, fujimoto is an interesting architect uh not uh, totally above blame but uh, an interesting architect and this is one of the earlier works he did near louvre in paris so japanese architect su fujimoto has created an installation in park jardin de tuileries composed of su suspended metal cubes and plants for the fiac art fair i don't know what that FIAC is, but maybe it's not so difficult to um, uh, to imagine. So this is the, the the installation made by Fujimoto, and it is uh, literally, uh, you know, a pixelated uh, installation. Maybe we we are we hesitate to call it architecture, although he calls this a nomadic house, and we are going to read a little bit about it uh it's almost like in a painting by salvador dali in fact you wonder you know did he did he defy gravity i mean i mean look at this how how how, how could it be this cube is flying or something well we are going to read how how he was able to realize this uh and here we see the louvre um, clearly and um, I guess this is uh, Rio Rivoli. Um, anyway, uh, the Le Jardin de Tuileries, where Andre Le Notre, the great uh, landscape architect, the great uh, gardener of uh, Louis Le Soleil, um, uh, worked. 
I think we need more uh, gardeners and more uh, landscape designers and more uh, many more gardeners in the world than, than architects, I'm afraid, at this point, because we need nature. Well, let's read a little bit about this uh, building. This, yeah, I guess we could call it building, Dalinian building. A void in the center represents the living area with formal entrances at either side and lots of other access points if one doesn't mind lowering the, the head, said the statement from Fujimoto. The structure is intended to represent a nomadic house and serve partly as an architectural intervention and partly as a sculpture. This made me, um, this makes me remember what Brunkus said. Brunkus saw that architecture is an inhabitable sculpture. And uh, with all due respect for Brunkus and admiration, I, I don't think he quite understood the nature of architecture. It, it is true that architecture benefits from uh, sculpturalness, but it's, it's, things are not so simple. It's more, than a, it's more than an inhabitable sculpture architecture. Uh, but this so-called nomadic house by, uh, by uh, Sugimoto is not a house in the, in the common sense of the word. It's the rather uh, uh, in machina a, a pensée, not a machina habité. It's not for to live in, but, but to think in or to think of. So let's read, the floating masses of many small cubes create a new experience of space a rhythm of flickering shadows and lights as being under the trees, said Fujimoto. Well, cubical trees, that is. The architecture forms one unified element whose balance and stability are carefully designed. The position of each cube and each tree participates to the overall stability, yet reaching a random-like feeling, bringing the whole architecture closer to nature. This aspect, random-like feeling, is important for Fujimoto and maybe should become important or could become important for us as well. Randomness. Uh, randomness, because randomness is giving us at least the illusion that, that there is, there is uh, uh, room for, uh, for uh, the unprogrammed, uh, for, for the unwill, unwilled, you know, for, for things that uh, escape our, our uh, control. And I think uh, there are positive uh, uh, attributes uh, that can be um, related to this. Supported on a steel frame, the cubes are made from sheets of anodized aluminum that have been individually hand cut to fit into place. And this is a generic and a schematic, a diagrammatic plan uh, for one floor, one level. <clears throat> a small tower built from scaffolding nearby contains a projector from which images are shown onto the surfaces of the cubes on one side of the structure. Uh, this is another, you know, horizontal section through the, through the installation. And now uh, we arrive at something else in, uh, in, uh, in uh, South Korea, a very interesting work. I, if I understood correctly, was about memorializing uh, uh, a past train. And uh, it's an installation, a nostalgic set of sculptures in that place in South Korea, remind the younger generation of past passages. It was a train that connected to places in South Korea, and it was used by laborers and students and so on. But look what they did. It's, it's like the wagon of a, of a train, no? And uh, the pixelation uh, is like a metaphor for the passage of time, the disintegration of one's, you know, monolithic uh, uh, structures. But I think it's engaging, uh, you know, visually as a kind of in-between architecture and sculpture. And there are two actually, uh, and uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a good work. And uh, you see here, you know, uh, part of the sculpture, there is a reading lady, like in a, in a train, you know, and, but, but, the, but the, the building or the, the installation evokes, you know, the shadow, the mental shadow of the, of the, 
you know, uh, past, uh, past train. And I think if you are not totally insensitive, it, it could make you think about the passage of time when, when you know, everything becomes sooner or later, um, you know, it disintegrates and, uh, you know, at one point disappears. South Korea. So the pixelation could 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 work in 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 many ways, artistically or architecturally or both. But I like this image. You know, this uh, eroded um, you know car of a of a past train that does not exist any longer, that that does not run any longer. So it became just the the ghost of what once was. So all the residents of this uh, place in South Korea will remember a narrow gauge railway that took the Sioux inline train through a landscape of beaches and salterns from 1937 to 1995. You, you originally used to move salt during imperial Japanese rule. The railway became a primary means of transportation for low income laborers and students after the Korean War. Seoul based, uh, Young Julie architecture is looking to reinvigorate the faded memory for a new generation of South Koreans using this pixelated stainless steel memorial composed of two interpretive sculptures. I call it dispersion one and dispersion two. And actually, I like the word dispersion because I think it connects with this fragmentation, this pixelation. So dispersion one is an exterior restoration of the train that starts off pixelated and dematerialized, but then solidifies or vice versa, depending upon the viewer's angle. Dispersion two, a second car that trails closely behind, reimagines the former train's interior. It features a seated woman silhouette on one side, invoking an atmosphere of the past and allowing visitors of the memorial to join her. And, and these are the two dispersions, if I am to, if, if they call them so. Now, a pixel building, Australia's first carbon neutral building is now complete with, a, with an exclamation mark. And it's colorful this time. It's not gray, it's not, well, it might be metallic, but look at this. Well, this is Australia. There is a, a level of exuberance in Australia that makes Australia, you know, uh, distinct in a way, a little bit neurotically so, but uh, still, uh, uh, you know, the pixelation is a little different from, from, from what we saw until now. And yes, colors, red, green, uh, you know, opposing colors, why not? I like color, I think color is life. And, uh, you know, uh, nothing wrong with it. Australia, pixelations, uh, exuberant, exuberant pixelation, more exuberant, perhaps mainly because of the color, but also the, the you know, the, uh, a certain, a certain disordered uh, um, exuberance, maybe, this is the definition of exuberance, you know, to be disordered or to provoke disorder if it is, if it is very accentuated, if it is extreme. Now, Birmingham pixelated building, this is in Great Britain. Uh, here again, we, we have the same temptation to sabotage the prism, the, the simple, simplistic reading of the building and to uh, yes, to fragment it, kind of like uh, to create a, a pointillist painting, you know, uh, uh, the impression is began and then the pointillist Seurat, for example, in the 19th century, began to paint like this with little dots, you know, and create a hole with little dots. Here we have the hole, we have the building, and then we, 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 we sabotage it in its monolithic uh, a certitude and uh, fragment it, fragment it. And uh, I guess there is a need for something like this because otherwise they would not have done it. Now here the pixelation is rather bi-dimensional as opposed to, uh, you know, some previous examples. 
but it's still a work I think worth mentioning. Now MVRDV again designs pixelated towers for Seoul. Now here you are going to see a, a work that was actually criticized and vehemently and condemned and they even apologize for it and you'll understand why. Because they, they manage and I don't think they were unaware of it when they did it. This is a, a, a clear echo of the World Trade Center bombing, no? I mean, it's impossible for me to, to think that they didn't, um, they didn't know this. They, need, they did and they probably, but, but again, you, 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 you could ask yourself why the need to, uh, to, to um, provoke this violence to those priests, to those two priests, why? There, there must have been a reason for it. In this case, uh, the similarity with what happened on September 11 was just too striking, and that's why they, they apologized. And here we see, we see the work on the left, sorry for the resolution of this picture. And on the right, we see the disaster of the World Trade Center. Uh, here we see another, another picture, the proposal by MVRDV in the name of uh, pixelated architecture. And on the right, uh, the drama of September 11. Essentially, is about the same thing. But you could you could ask yourself what made MVRDV make this proposal? Yes, they were criticized, and they apologized. But I I think an interesting question is exactly the one I I, I tried to put forward. Why did they do it this way? Because they knew they knew what they were doing. That's, that's what I think. It is too obvious, the, the resemblance. The roof house. Now, this is a very interesting house. And, you know, because I was supposed to talk with, to the, the second year students about the, the project, uh, you know, in their studios about uh, the, you know, the one, the one family house. This one attracted my attention and it fits into the, uh, into this theme. See, uh, pixelated architecture uh, and pixelated it is on many levels. Uh, again, you know, I personally welcome this, this uh, you know, uh, treatment of the, the opaque facade because I myself am tired of white walls, you know, plain walls, you know, plus we need some kind of a, at least the illusion of handmade things, you know, where you place a brick above another brick or, uh, you know, whatever block of ceramics or whatever you use uh, to connect yourself with a certain past and, uh, you know, maybe even with the earth. I think this one is done uh, rather, rather well. Uh, I'm not so sure about this part of the building. I, I, I prefer this one because of the of the randomness well there is structure but there is uh, also the the ornament of randomness or, or the randomness of ornament while here things are a little bit predictable and, and and cold for my taste at least but it's still an interesting house when you think about it you know i mean this kind of house uh, probably would not have imagined, uh, you know, a, a while ago, and now it is, and it is even built. Now, of course, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, complexity was achieved brilliantly, you know, in Islamic architecture, you know, where you had stalactites and stalagmites, where you had the unbelievable complexities, geometric complexities, and where each part contributed to the whole. But this is a modern house. It's a modernistic statement and gesture. And uh, it's both outside and inside. It's not a masterpiece. But I think it has interesting elements. And it should make one think about how to build in the present. And I like the fact that it doesn't have a relationship with a pixelation. But I like the fact that. Uh, I guess they welcomed uh, an existing graffiti or they, uh, they commissioned it, you know, to, to have the, the guerrilla 
aesthetic intervention as part of the house. So it's it's it, what we see here. It's an attempt to uh, bring uh, nonconformism uh, uh, explicitly to the you know physiognomy of the building. This is my favorite picture of this house because of this wall, which doesn't even need windows or doors. I mean, I'm not talking in functional terms, in aesthetical terms, because it is vibrated, it is alive as it is. And by the way of this, I read uh, today in a book about Konstantin Brunkush that he wanted to make a, a, a temple in India without any doors and without any windows. And, um, you know, this reminds me of a discussion I, I, uh, I, I learned about between John Haydock and Peter Eisenman, where um, uh, Peter Eisenman uh, commented critically on a building by um, John Haydock that uh, doesn't have uh, an entrance door. And, uh, <laughs> People cannot enter the building. And John Haydock apparently responded to him, you can't enter the building, Peter. You, you, Peter, I, you cannot enter, but my friends can, although they were friends and they were even both partners of, uh, I mean, members of the same group, the New York Five. But the truth is there is a lot of past, so-called past architecture that uh, you know uh, problematizes uh, vehemently my our assumptions you know there are temples in southeast asia that uh, you know cannot be accessed or what about the pyramids the egyptian pyramids yes there might be an access but it is hidden there are no windows of course it's a funeral architecture but what I'm trying to say is not architecture has to be eaten up by our hungry consumer and used every square inch. Maybe we can contemplate an architecture which is not to be consumed, not to be possessed every single inch, and maybe not even accessed. You know, what if we build a building that cannot be accessed, but a beautiful building, a building which is a, an homage to the gods that created life? whoever they are. What, why can't we be like this? Why do we have to enter everything and everywhere? Why? Because Ernest Neufer says so. Anyway, and now uh, what is this? Uh, I don't even know how to read this. I mean, it's in English. Uh, Hangzhou waves, boast, mirrored office and hotel structures. Uh, the, the wording is probably translated from, from, from Chinese. Uh, welcome to pixelated architecture, right? And pixelated it is, but rather in a almost predictable way, influences from big, from Bjarke Ingels, uh, you know, pixelation is pixelation, a cascade of uh, terraces and, uh, you know, it's not particularly special, but uh, I included it in the presentation for some reason. Um, maybe because I thought the presentation was too short otherwise. And so let's stop for a moment here.